Section 19 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Malzel's Chess Player, Part 2, by Edgar Allan Poe it will be necessary for a proper understanding of the subject that we repeat here in a few words the routine adopted by the exhibitor in disclosing the interior of the box a routine from which he never deviates in any material particular in the first place he opens the door number one leaving this open he goes round to the rear of the box and opens a door precisely at the back of door number one. To this back door he holds a lighted candle. He then closes the back door, locks it, and coming round to the front, opens the drawer to its full extent. This done, he opens the doors number two and number three, the folding doors and displays the interior of the main compartment. Leaving open the main compartment, the drawer, and the front door of cupboard number one, he now goes to the rear again, and throws open the back door of the main compartment. In shutting up the box, no particular order is observed, except the folding doors are always closed before the drawer. Now, let us suppose that when the machine is first rolled in the presence of the spectators a man is already within it his body is situated behind the dense machinery in cupboard number one the rear portion of the machinery is so contrived as to slip en masse from the main compartment to cupboard number one as occasion may require and his legs lie at full length in the main compartment when malzel opens the door number one the man within is not in any danger of discovery for the keenest eyes cannot penetrate more than about two inches into the darkness within but the case is otherwise when the back door of the cupboard number one is open a bright light then pervades the cupboard and the body of the man would be discovered if it were there but it is not the putting the key in the lock of the back door was a signal on hearing which the person concealed wrought his body forward to an angle as acute as possible throwing it altogether or nearly so into the main compartment this however is a painful position and cannot be long maintained accordingly we find that malzel closes the back door this being done there is no reason why the body of the man may not resume its former situation for the cupboard is again so dark as to defy scrutiny the drawer is now open and the legs of the person within drop down behind it in the space it formerly occupied there is consequently now no longer any part of the man in the main compartment his body being behind the machinery in cupboard number one and his legs in the space occupied by the drawer the exhibitor therefore finds himself at liberty to display the main compartment this he does opening both its back and front doors and no person is discovered the spectators are now satisfied that the whole of the box is exposed to view and exposed to all portions of it at one and the same time but of course this is not the case they neither see the space behind the drawer nor the interior of cupboard number one the front door of which latter the exhibitor virtually shuts 
in shutting its back door. Malzil, having now rolled the machine around, lifted up the drapery of the Turk, opened the doors in his back and thigh, and shown his trunk to be full of machinery, brings the whole back into its original position and closes the door. The man within is now at liberty to move about. He gets up into the body of the Turk, just so high as to bring his eyes above the level of the chessboard. It is very probable that he sits himself upon the little square block or protuberance which is seen in a corner of the main compartment when the doors are open. In this position he sees the chessboard through the bosom of the Turk, which is of gauze. Bringing his right arm across his breast, he actuates the little machinery necessary to guide the left arm and the fingers of the figure. This machinery is situated just beneath the left shoulder of the Turk, and is consequently easily reached by the right hand of the man concealed if we suppose his right arm brought across the breast. The motions of the head and eyes, and of the right arm of the figure, as well as the sound check, are produced by other mechanism in the interior, and actuated at will by the man within. The whole of this mechanism, that is to say all the mechanism essential to the machine, is most probably contained within the little cupboard of about six inches in breadth, partitioned off at the right, the spectator's right, of the main compartment. In this analysis of the operations of the automaton, we have purposely avoided any allusion to the manner in which the partitions are shifted, and it will now be readily comprehended that this point is a matter of no importance, since by mechanisms within the ability of any common carpenter it might be effected in an infinity of different ways, and since we have shown that however performed, it is performed out of the view of the spectators. Our result is founded upon the following observations taken during frequent visits to the exhibition of Malzil. 1. The moves of the Turk are not made at regular intervals of time, but accommodate themselves to the moves of the antagonist. Although this point of regularity, so important to all kinds of mechanical contrivance, might have been readily brought about by limiting the time allowed for the moves of the antagonist. For example, if this limit were three minutes, the moves of the automaton might be made at any given intervals longer than three minutes. The fact, then, of irregularity, when regularity might have been so easily attained, goes to prove that regularity is unimportant to the action of the automaton. In other words, that the automaton is not a pure machine. 2. When the automaton is about to move a piece, a distinct motion is observable just beneath the left shoulder and which motion agitates in a slight degree the drapery covering the front of the left shoulder. This motion invariably precedes by about two seconds the movement of the arm itself, and the arm never in any instance moves without this preparatory motion in the shoulder. Now let the antagonist move a piece, and let the corresponding move be made by Mausel as usual upon the board of the automaton. Then let the antagonist narrowly watch the automaton until he detect the preparatory motion in the shoulder. Immediately upon detecting this motion, and before the arm itself begins to move, let him withdraw his piece, as if perceiving an error in his maneuver, it will then be seen that the movement of the arm, which in all other cases immediately succeeds the motion in the shoulder, is withheld, is not made, although Malzil has not yet performed on the board of the automaton any move corresponding to the withdrawal of the antagonist. 
in this case that the automaton was about to move is evident and that he did not move was an effect plainly produced by the withdrawal of the antagonist and without any intervention of Mazel. This fact fully proves, one, that the intervention of Mazel in performing the moves of the antagonist on the board of the automaton is not essential to the movements of the automaton, two, that its movements are regulated by mind, by some person who sees the board of the antagonist, three, that its movements are not regulated by the mind of Mausel, whose back was turned towards the antagonist at the withdrawal of his move. 3. The automaton does not invariably win the game. Were the machine a pure machine, this would not be the case. It would always win. The principle being discovered by which a machine can be made to play a game of chess, an extension of the same principle would enable it to win a game. A farther extension would enable it to win all games, that is, to beat any possible game of an antagonist. A little consideration will convince anyone that the difficulty of making a machine beat all games is not in the least degree greater as regards the principle of the operations necessary than of making it beat a single game. If then we regard the chess player as a machine, we must suppose, what is highly improbable, that its inventor preferred leaving it incomplete to perfecting it, a supposition rendered still more absurd when we reflect that the leaving it incomplete would afford an argument against the possibility of its being a pure machine the very argument we now adduce for when the situation of the game is difficult or complex we never perceive the turk either shake his head or roll his eyes it is only when his next move is obvious or when the game is so circumstanced that to a man in the automaton's place there would be no necessity for reflection now these peculiar movements of the head and eyes are movements customary with persons engaged in meditation and the ingenious baron keplin would have adapted these movements with a machine a pure machine to occasions proper for their display that is to occasions of complexity but the reverse is seen to be the case and this reverse applies precisely to our supposition of a man in the interior when engaged in meditation about the game he has no time to think of setting in motion the mechanism of the automaton by which are moved the head and the eyes when the game however is obvious he has time to look about him and accordingly we see the head shake and the eyes roll five when the machine is rolled round to allow the spectators an examination of the back of the turk and when his drapery is lifted up and the doors in the trunk and thigh thrown open the interior of the trunk is seen to be crowded with machinery in scrutinizing this machinery while the automaton was in motion that is to say while the whole machine was moving on the casters it appeared to us that certain portions of the mechanism changed their shape and position in a degree too great to be accounted for by the simple laws of perspective and subsequent examinations convince us that these undue alterations were attributable to mirrors in the interior of the trunk the introduction of mirrors among the machinery could not have been intended to influence in any degree the machinery itself their operation whatever the operation should prove to be must necessarily have reference to the eye of the spectator. We at once conclude that these mirrors were so placed to multiply to the vision some few pieces of machinery within the trunk so as to give it the appearance of being crowded with mechanism. Now the direct inference from this is that the machine is not a pure machine for if it were the inventor so far from wishing its mechanism to appear complex and using deception for the purpose of giving it this appearance 
would have been especially desirous of convincing those who witnessed his exhibition of the simplicity of the means by which results so wonderful were brought about six the external appearance especially the deportment of the turk are when we consider them as imitations of life but very indifferent imitations the countenance evinces no ingenuity and is surpassed in its resemblance to the human face by the very commonest of waxworks the eyes roll unnaturally in the head without any corresponding motions of the lids or brows the arm particularly performs its operations in an exceedingly stiff awkward jerking and rectangular manner now all this is the result either of inability in mazel to do better or of intentional neglect accidental neglect being out of the question when we consider that the whole time of the ingenious proprietor is occupied in the improvement of his machines most assuredly we must not refer the unlifelike appearance to inability for all the rest of mazel's automata are evidence of his full ability to copy the motions and peculiarities of life with the most wonderful exactitude the rope dancers for example are inimitable when the clown laughs his lips his eyes his eyebrows and eyelids indeed all the features of his countenance are imbued with their appropriate expressions in both him and his companion every gesture is so entirely easy and free from the semblance of artificiality that were it not for the diminutiveness of their size and the fact of their being passed from one spectator to another previous to their exhibition on the rope it would be difficult to convince any assemblage of persons that these wooden automata were not living creatures we cannot therefore doubt mr mazel's ability and we must necessarily suppose that he intentionally suffered his chess-player to remain the same artificial and unnatural figure which baron kepler no doubt also through design originally made it what this design was it is not difficult to conceive were the automaton lifelike in its motions the spectator would be more apt to attribute its operations to their true cause that is to human agency within than he is now when the awkward and rectangular manoeuvres convey the idea of pure and unaided mechanism seven when a short time previous to the commencement of the game the automaton is wound up by the exhibitor as usual an ear in any degree accustomed to the sounds produced in winding up a system of machinery will not fail to discover instantaneously that the axis turned by the key in the box of the chess player cannot possibly be connected with either a weight a spring or any system of machinery whatever the inference here is the same as in our last observation the winding up is inessential to the operations of the automaton and is performed with the design of exciting in the spectators the false idea of mechanism eight when the question is demanded explicitly of mazel is the automaton a pure machine or not his reply is invariably the same i will say nothing about it now the notoriety of the automaton and the great curiosity it has everywhere excited are owing more especially to the prevalent opinion that it is a pure machine than to any other circumstance of course then it is the interest of the proprietor to represent it as a pure machine and what more obvious and more effectual method could there be of impressing the spectators with this desired idea than a positive and explicit declaration to that effect on the other hand what more obvious and effectual method could there be of exciting a disbelief in the automaton's being a pure machine than by withholding such explicit declaration 
for people will naturally reason thus it is maelzel's interest to represent this thing a pure machine he refuses to do so directly in words although he does not scruple and is evidently anxious to do so indirectly by actions were it actually what he wishes to represent it by actions he would gladly avail himself of the more direct testimony of words the inference is that a consciousness of its not being a pure machine is the reason of his silence his actions cannot implicate him in a falsehood his words may nine when in exhibiting the interior of the box maelzel has thrown open the door number one and also the door immediately behind it he holds a lighted candle at the back door as mentioned above and moves the entire machine to and fro with a view of convincing the company that cupboard number one is entirely filled with machinery when the machine is thus moved about it will be apparent to any careful observer that whereas that portion of the machinery near the front door number one is perfectly steady and unwavering the portion farther within fluctuates in a very slight degree with the movements of the machine this circumstance first aroused in us the suspicion that the more remote portion of the machinery was so arranged as to be easily slipped en masse from its position when occasion should require it this occasion we have already stated to occur when the man concealed within brings his body into an erect position upon the closing of the back door Ten sir david brewster states the figure of the turk to be the size of life but in fact it is far above the ordinary size nothing is more easy than to err in our notions of magnitude the body of the automaton is generally insulated and having no means of immediately comparing it with any human form we suffer ourselves to consider it as of ordinary dimensions this mistake may however be corrected by observing the chess player when as is sometimes the case the exhibitor approaches it mr maelzel to be sure is not very tall but upon drawing near the machine his head will be found at least eighteen inches below the head of the turk although the latter it will be remembered is in a sitting position eleven the box behind which the automaton is placed is precisely three feet six inches long two feet four inches deep and two feet six inches high these dimensions are sufficient for the accommodation of a man very much above the common size and the main compartment alone is capable of holding any ordinary man in the position we have mentioned and assumed by the person concealed as these are facts which any one who doubts them may prove by actual calculation we deem it unnecessary to dwell upon them we will only suggest that although the top of the box is apparently a board of about three inches in thickness the spectator may satisfy himself by stooping and looking up at it when the main compartment is open that it is in reality very thin the height of the drawer also will be misconceived by those who examine it in a cursory manner there is a space of about three inches between the top of the drawer as seen from the exterior and the bottom of the cupboard a space which must be included in the height of the drawer these contrivances to make the room within the box appear less than it actually is are referable to a design on the part of the inventor to impress the company again with a false idea viz that no human being can be accommodated within the box twelve the interior of the main compartment is lined throughout with cloth this cloth we suppose to have a twofold object 
a portion of it may form when tightly stretched the only partitions which there is any necessity for removing during the changes of the man's position viz the partition between the rear of the main compartment and the rear of the cupboard number one and the partition between the main compartment and the space behind the drawer when open if we imagine this to be the case the difficulty of shifting the partitions vanishes at once if indeed any such difficulty could be supposed under any circumstances to exist the second object of the cloth is to deaden and render indistinct all sounds occasioned by the movements of the person within thirteen the antagonist as we have observed is not suffered to play at the board of the automaton but is seated at some distance from the machine the reason which most probably would be assigned for this circumstance if the question were demanded is that were the antagonist otherwise situated his person would intervene between the machine and the spectators and preclude the latter from a distinct view but this difficulty might be easily obviated either by elevating the seats of the company or by turning the end of the box towards them during the game the true cause of the restriction is perhaps very different were the antagonist seated in contact with the box the secret would be liable to discovery by his detecting with the aid of a quick ear the breathing of the man concealed fourteen although m mausel in disclosing the interior of the machine sometimes slightly deviates from the routine which we have pointed out yet really in any instance does he so deviate from it as to interfere with our solution for example he has been known to open first of all the drawer but he never opens the main compartment without first closing the back door of cupboard number one he never opens the main compartment without first pulling out the drawer he never shuts the drawer without first shutting the main compartment he never opens the back door of cupboard number one while the main compartment is open and the game of chess is never commenced until the whole machine is closed and if it were observed that never in any single instance did m malzel differ from the routine we have pointed out as necessary to our solution it would be one of the strongest possible arguments in corroboration of it but the argument becomes infinitely strengthened if we duly consider the circumstance that he does occasionally deviate from the routine but never does so deviate as to falsify the solution fifteen there are six candles on the board of the automaton during exhibition the question naturally arises why are so many employed when a single candle or at farthest two would have been amply sufficient to afford the spectators a clear view of the board in a room otherwise so well lit up as the exhibition room always is when moreover if we suppose the machine a pure machine there can be no necessity for so much light or indeed any light at all to enable it to perform its operations and when especially only a single candle is placed upon the table of the antagonist the first and most obvious inference is that so strong a light is requisite to enable the man within to see through the transparent material probably fine gauze of which the breast of the turk is composed but when we consider the arrangement of the candles another reason immediately presents itself there are six lights as we have said before in all three of these are on each side of the figure those most remote from the spectators are the longest those in the middle are about two inches shorter and those nearest the company about two inches shorter still and the candles on one side differ in height from the candles respectively opposite on the other by a ratio different from two inches that is to say the longest candle on one side is about three inches shorter than the longest candle on the other and so on 
Thus it will be seen that no two of the candles are of the same height, and thus also the difficulty of ascertaining the material of the breast of the figure against which the light is especially directed is greatly augmented by the dazzling effect of the complicated crossing of the rays, crossings which are brought about by placing the centers of radiation all upon different levels. 16. While the chess player was in possession of Baron Keplin, it was more than once observed, first, that an Italian in the suite of the Baron was never visible during the playing of a game at chess by the Turk, and secondly, that the Italian being taken seriously ill, the exhibition was suspended until his recovery. The Italian professed a total ignorance of the game of chess, although all others of the suite played well. Similar observations have been made since the automaton has been purchased by Mausel. There is a man Schlumberger who attends him wherever he goes, but who has no ostensible occupation other than that of assisting in the packing and unpacking of the automata. This man is about the medium size and has a remarkable stoop in the shoulders. Whether he professes to play chess or not, we are not informed. It is quite certain, however, that he is never to be seen during the exhibition of the chess player, although frequently visible just before and just after the exhibition. Moreover, some years ago, Malzo visited Richmond with his automata, and exhibited them, we believe, in the house now occupied by Monsieur Beauzieux as a dancing academy, Schlumberger was suddenly taken ill, and during his illness there was no exhibition of the chess player. These facts are well known to many of our citizens. The reason assigned for the suspicion of the chess player's performance was not the illness of Schlumberger. The inferences from all this we leave without farther comment to the reader seventeen the turk plays with his left arm a circumstance so remarkable cannot be accidental brewster takes no notice of it whatever beyond a mere statement we believe that such is the fact the early writers of trustees on the automaton seem not to have observed the matter at all and have no reference to it the author of the pamphlet alluded to by Brewster mentions it, but acknowledges his inability to account for it. Yet it is obviously from such prominent discrepancies or incongruities as this that deductions are to be made, if made at all, which shall lead us to the truth. The circumstance of the automatons playing with his left hand cannot have connection with the operations of the machine considered merely as such. Any mechanical arrangement would cause the figure to move in any given manner. The left arm could, if reversed, cause it to move in the same manner the right. But these principles cannot be extended to the human organization, wherein there is a marked and radical difference in the construction and, at all events, in the powers of the right and left arms. Reflecting upon this latter fact, we naturally refer to the incongruity noticeable in the chess player to this peculiarity in the human organization. If so, we must imagine some reversion, for the chess player plays precisely as a man would not. These ideas, once entertained, are sufficient of themselves to suggest the notion of a man in the interior. A few more perceptible steps lead us finally to the result. The automaton plays with his left arm because under no other circumstances could the man within play with his right. A desideratum, of course. Let us, for example, imagine the automaton to play with his right arm. To reach the machinery which moves the arm, which we have before explained to lie just beneath the shoulder, 
it would be necessary for the man within either to use his right arm in an exceedingly painful and awkward position viz brought up close to his body and tightly compressed between his body and the side of the automaton or else to use his left arm brought across his breast in neither case could he act with the requisite ease or precision on the contrary the automaton playing as it actually does with the left arm all difficulties vanish the right arm of the man within is brought across his breast and his right fingers act without any constraint upon the machinery in the shoulder of the figure we do not believe that any reasonable objection can be urged against this solution of the automaton chess player End of section 19 Recording by Susan Moran, Portland, Maine